bag. Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Catholic Coffee Talk, a podcast where in between sips, we answer your Catholic questions. I'm your host, Father Brad Doyle, and I have with me our resident good Catholic, Peter Gohn. What's up, my fellow? You know, not too much. I'm just getting ready for Lent, gearing up. Mm. So that's a big difference between, um, I don't know, me being in Louisiana and you. Like, I don't even think about, well, <laughs> this is bad. <laughs> but, but like, <laughs> right now, I, no one would ever be like, yeah, just gearing up for Lent. We'd be like, getting ready for Mardi Gras. Oh, yeah. and, then, <laughs> and then immediately, in like an instant, we're like, and now give us Lent. Oh, yeah. Um, the, someone the other day, I think Polycarp was on his, I think maybe it was just cause of the fees of Polycarp. Yeah, I don't yeah. know who it is. You know, the Twitter guy, Polycarp. I don't know the Twitter guy, Polycarp. I'm oh, not okay. on Twitter, the, but there's some guy who had, anyway, he, he posted like, how's everyone's Ash Wednesday going? And everyone on the feed was like, whoa, 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 wait, is Ash Wednesday? Oh, okay. You got us. You got us. <laughs> I was like, there's zero chance you got anyone from Louisiana. <laughs> Like, we all know it's not Ash Wednesday <laughs> because we haven't had Mardi Gras yet. So that's what we're doing over here, getting ready. I actually have a bishop, uh, Bishop Ricard. He's a Josephite bishop coming in to do a mission appeal Cool for our parish. Um, and so he gave me the weekend off. So I'm going down to New Orleans with family and friends. I'm nice. going to say mass on the neutral ground uh, before, like in the morning on Sunday. and the, on, the on the route. On the neutral ground? Yeah, the neutral ground is that that's if you go to New Orleans, there's where the streetcars run. They they there's like grassy area in between uh-huh. two streets, like a boulevard. Okay. Um, and streetcars run in each direction on that grassy boulevard, and it's called the neutral ground um, because the history of it was that it separated different nationality sections of New gotcha. Orleans. So like the French are on one side, and mm-hmm. the and the Spanish Italians from the Italians, other, yeah. and the Irish from the other, and so it was the neutral ground. Okay. And and that's where you set up. You either set up on the neutral ground side or on the uh, street side of um, of a parade route. And so we set up on the neutral ground and I s- sleep out there all night, saving a spot, say mass at 8 a.m. in the morning. Then uh, let the Jameson and Ginger flow. It sounds beautiful. The The day will come when I finally get down to New Orleans and you can show me around. It's Dude, this would have been the year because it's oh, our first man. one back since COVID. Yeah. And it's like gorgeous weather. It's going to be 45 in the morning, 65, completely sunny on Lundy Gras. We are gorgeous. jacked. <laughs> gorgeous, gorgeous. Well, I hope you uh, have a great time. Speaking of getting jacked, I'm jacked about answering some questions. Yeah, What's percolating? Hi, everyone. I just wanted to hop in to tell you that we are about to launch our new and only Good Catholic Lent series. Now we've done a lot of different series during Lent, but this is the first one where we take you through the season itself so we can unlock its great mysteries and liturgies for your spiritual life so that you can have a holy Lent. Now the series is available on pre-order right now and it will begin on Ash Wednesday and it will take you all the way to Easter Sunday. There will be new video content every day from Father Jeffrey Kirby, who will walk you through the Lenten spirituality and draw on the church's tradition so that you can have a really fruitful Lent in your spiritual life. But there's not so much there every day that it's going to be overwhelming for you. We want you to be able to persevere through the long and penitential season of Lent without getting discouraged and without feeling bogged down because it is a long season. But we're going to walk with you all the way from Ash Wednesday to Easter Sunday. So sign up today at goodcatholic.com. We'll put a link in the description and we're really looking forward to having you join us. Where the questions percolating in your head get answers from the church's tradition. We got a good one today, don't we, Peter? Yeah, it is. And I think it's one that a lot of people have thought of at one point or another, especially early in their formation, but like getting a really good nuanced answer is harder to do than you'd think. So wait, hold on before you go, we're just, we're going to flip it and reverse it because I have to tell you a story about the feast of the chair of St. Peter. I look down and the intention for the feast of the chair of St. Peter that my secretary randomly assigned 
is for a man named Pete Peter. There's a name. <laughs> Do you? And I was like, am I? Is, I had all these thoughts like in, in an instant. Like, am I getting punked by my parishioners? Is this like right. a joke? But like she randomly assigned it. So on the Feast of the Chair of St. Peter, Pete Peter hopefully was finally purged and met St. Peter at the pearly gate. I hope so. And they just had a, a Peter party. I hope so. I hope so. So anyway, keep going. What's the All question? Right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. This, here's the question. This comes from someone who wanted to remain a little anonymous. Uh, they just signed their question from a Roman Catholic. So here's his or her question. There's a lot of, there's a lot of those. There's like <laughs> billions. We, we don't know who it is. For all I know, this guy could be in Rome. Um, but who knows? Uh, that's true. <laughs> all right. He says, I believe in the Ten Commandments and believe they're the foundation of a Roman Catholic church. I am struggling with and have a question relating to war and or abortion. Both situations are paths to kill or take a life. So my question is, the Fifth Commandment states, thou shalt not kill. So does that mean that men who fought and killed in wars, or even policemen in the line of duty, or women who have gotten an abortion, may confess their most grievous mortal sins in confession and consequently be forgiven and regain the pathway to heaven? So he's asking about kind of the, the morality of different instances where someone is killed, and then the relative ability for the church in confession to forgive such sins. And he says, isn't deliberately taking life in any way still killing? Gotcha. Yeah, there's two questions, as you pointed out. Mm -hmm. um, the sec the second one we'll answer later, which is, you know, can we be forgiven for it? Um, and, and the answer is yes, but we'll kind of go deeper into that. But first, these distinctions between these situations, and yeah. um, and they're very different situations, and, and so the church addresses this. And I want to start, too, I was thinking about this earlier. I had a had a meeting, and I, and I talked to the, uh, this couple about the progression of understanding in the church that we go from, you know, maybe uh, an, an, um, John Henry Newman, we've talked about it before, but the development of doctrine, right? Mm -hmm. So that like you have a sapling and the sapling is the, you know, the, the fresh new teaching of Christ. Right. Uh, he founded the church, but that, that sapling develops over time and never changes its essence and never changes its being. It's still it the is same. What it, plant, it's still, the, still same the same organization, but uh, they, yes, sorry. That was a phone ringing. Sorry. Um, it's still the same thing, but it might we might have a better or a more robust understanding of it. And mm -hmm. so um, the teaching, the commandment, thou shalt not kill, never changes. But we have a more robust understanding of it, especially as it relates to different situations in our lives. And so we're going to make these distinctions. And the principle that I want to bring up and explain in making this distinction is called the principle of double effect. OK, it, mm -hmm. it, it sounds very fancy, but it literally is what it says. It is that uh, there could be actions that have multiple effects. In fact, we know this as human beings right. uh, that, you know, we do something or we choose something or we commit something and there might be multiple effects that, that flow from that, you know, the butterfly effect, if you think of it that <laughs> yeah. way. Um, now, you can have good effects and even bad effects. So an action right. can have multiple good effects. It could be totally wrong and be have multiple bad effects. Uh, but often there's these situations where you have, you know, an action that we take, a step that we take mm -hmm. um, might have a good effect and a bad effect. And so the principle of double effect is that um, any action we do in order for it to be good and be justly chosen, um, that has to meet these certain criteria. The action itself has to be good. So right. we can't justify an evil action because of a good effect. That would right. be, uh, what's the philosophy that that is? What is well, it? sometimes it's called like Machiavellian because he's the one who said like the ends justify the means. Ah, okay. But that's like, right. yeah, but he wasn't really a philosopher. Util talking about morality. Utilitarian. Or utili is yeah. Utilitarianism. Yeah. You can't do something wrong and have it be right just because it leads to something good. Like you can't use evil for good. Yeah. I mean, oh, so a, a very drastic, but clear uh, example of this would be, you know, you can't, uh, immorally uh, test on human beings 
in order to find some cure for cancer. You can't yeah. like take away their freedom and or what they did with like the uh, contraceptive pill where they didn't tell people that they were giving them yeah. the, the contraceptive pill in right. order to make these tests and some people died. Like that's yeah. it, at the end of the day, the, there might be an effect like for some of these tests where we learn how to cure some disease, but we did it through immoral action. Right. So that immoral action is always wrong. Um, and so the action itself has to be good. Okay, so that's number one. The intended effect has to be good. So we can't be doing uh, a, a good action, but then intending it to be uh, a bad result. An example of this that I use, use is, um, you know, if your friend doesn't have a dress to prom, like, you know, you're in high school and your friend's mm-hmm. like, oh, I need a dress to prom. You could give her, let her borrow one of your dresses, right? Uh, that's a good action. But if your intended effect is you know she's going to look worse than you because <laughs> you're giving her the worst dress yeah. and like you want her to look bad because they're you know you know she's going to look bad in yep. this, then that's bad. Okay? Right. right. So the intended effect has to be good. And if there's any unintended evil effects, bad effects, they have to be proportionate to the good effect. So um, an example of this would be... Um, like cosmetic stuff, uh, like you, you, like a lot of times with when when it comes to mutilation, right? So uh, mutilating your body uh, is bad. Okay, right. Full um, stop. Full stop. <laughs> but 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 think of it like with with medicine, like um, like s- surgery, amputation, right? Mm, yeah. Amputation. The act of amputation. One, it's not mutilation. It's actually trying to address a pathology and. Mm. You would die if you didn't amputate your leg. Well, the difference right. between amputation and mutilation is the intention. Exactly, because you're trying to you're you're addressing a medical situation where you would die if you didn't amputate right. your leg. Right. right, and if that's not but, the case, and that's not the intention, then it's not an amputation. <laughs> yeah, that that's very true. But yeah, I, I was trying to I say mean. I was yeah. trying to say that like if you think you would look better, or it just becomes this cool like yeah. thing to like have one leg and like you're doing it just for aesthetics. Like that's not proportionate. Right. The good effect of like some aesthetic choice that you have does not make that action good. It's not proportionate right. to the evil, right. which is amputation. Yep. Yep. Um, okay. That, well, that might I, be a little convoluted, but you get what I'm saying. So yeah, and, the and, and t- sorry, you said the unintended evil effect has to be proportionate to the good effect. Does this mean or less, less than or less? Yeah. That's only for things you know are going to happen or it can reasonably predict they're going to happen. It's not like, mm-hmm. it's not like if you do something good and then a completely outside of your control and in a way you can't predict something really bad happens as a result that somehow your action is now like bad. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, because we right. can't, we can't know or control all these these different facets of life, you know. So true, you got to know about it, right? Um, and so, but and then it has to be a last resort. So let's say you have like a pretty equal good effect and evil effect, and the evil effects unintended. You don't desire to do that or have that be the case, but it is proportionate to the good effect. The action itself is good. Uh, you you still have to make sure it's the last resort. Mm-hmm. So um, you exhaust all other means. This will play in whenever we apply to the just war theory. But yeah. Um, so now apply that to your question, uh, Roman Catholic out there. There is a difference between self defense and murder. The action of murder, right? right. So in in a situation of self defense where lethal force might be used. The action itself is not taking someone's life who is innocent. The action itself is stopping someone from killing someone else or, or gravely you, harming yeah. someone else or, mm-hmm. or attacking your family. Um, if, the, if, if the proportionate, if, if your family would die, someone's attacking your family and your family would die, then the unintended evil effect, which is this person dying, is proportionate. But your intention, the good intention, was to protect your family. Right. Right? So the action is to protect your family, which is good. The intended good effect is that your family survives and you Mm -hmm. survive. 
the unintended evil effect is that this person died because in order to stop them, you had to use a lethal force and it's the last resort. Right. And so that, that goes from case to case. But so that's the difference between uh, self-defense and murder. Right? Murder is you're taking someone's life. That's the intended effect. Like you, right. you go after them, you're going to kill them. You're going to take their life. There's no proportionate reason. And that's the intended effect. Yeah. You're always responding. Right. You're always responding. I think of it with with a lot of martial arts. Right. Uh, you hear like they're, very, they're they're not on the aggressive. They're not. You're always trying to respond and mitigate the situation before right. acting. Yeah. The yeah, other no, way would be the Cobra wise. Kai way. <laughs> right. <laughs> just like, you know, just beat this person. No, we don't know. We're responding. So self-defense. Right. Now, you can apply that to uh, situations of war. So. Uh, you know, individually, we can defend ourselves. Well, as nations, we can also defend ourselves if all of these criteria are met, right? So that would be what St. Augustine and, and theologians later, as they continue to uh, develop theology, develop our understanding of these commandments and how they apply. And um, we didn't need this before Christianity was legal. Because <laughs> Christianity was illegal. We had no power. We had no nations. We had no, right. nothing, right? right? So, like, leaders of countries were not Christians, right? Mm-hmm. So, but what happens when we have leaders of countries, kings and emperors, and and now they're leading entire nations, entire countries in which there is maybe a need to respond to an aggressive nation, right? I mean, we're, we're, we're right in the thick of it right now of, yeah. with the news about yep. Ukraine and Russia. I'm not going to... Yep. We're not going to get into the but yeah, political this, science of it. This is uh, important still today. Yeah. Let's put it that so, way. So, the, so what did St. Augustine and the theologians who developed just war theory um, say? They just apply the principle of double effect and self-defense to nations. And they said, listen, if uh, you're just trying to defend yourself, okay, so you're engaging in a war in which there's another aggressor. You're not the aggressor. You're trying to defend yourself. Um, mm-hmm. The intended effect is to defend yourself. The unintended effect is others may die because you're using right. lethal force, but it also has to be the last resort. And we, we saw in you know situation recently, it's like you're trying to do peace treaties. You're trying to do peace treaties. Right. You're, and then you got to respond if someone's attacking you. Um, and, and, and so that's applied to just war. So a, a soldier that finds themselves uh, following orders in a situation where, um, you know, they are defending their brother soldiers in a battle, uh, then it's not breaking the fifth commandment as per a developed understanding of our commandments, okay? Mm -hmm. Um, But there might be situations where a Christian might have to conscientiously object to an order that a superior gives them. So, like, you're not absolved Mm -hmm. from... from, uh, all culpability just because it's a superior's order. So let's say if there's, you know, a superior commands, unjustly commands their soldiers to uh, break, you know, Geneva war rules yeah. and, and yeah, like I mean, to, kill. To, to, to kill a prisoner of war or to, to deliberately kill civilians and target civilians or things like that. Yeah, that wouldn't you know? fall under just war because that's not just war. Right. So uh, I know there's a lot more distinctions and there's other people who are way smarter uh, that can, but that's basically the foundation uh, of, of answering this question that there's differences and why can't abortion ever be considered just is because um, the action itself is just taking this child's life. Um, That's the action itself and that can never be, be good. Right. I mean, can there, be some situations where there is a medical procedure, which as a side effect, you can predict or reasonably predict that a child might die in utero in order to save the life of a mother. If Uh, it was in that kind of situation and that uh, procedure isn't just an abortion, that's principle of double effect too, right? That absolutely. And a lot of times in bioethics, this principle of double effect is applied in order to understand the morality of a situation in which let's say like a chemotherapy, Mm -hmm. you, you can reasonably, um, predict that an unintended evil effect is the death of a child, um, but the action itself is chemotherapy addressed mm-hmm. addressing a cancer of the mother, right? Right. Or even a situation of 
like um, and tubal tubal ligations, like tubal uh, ectopic pregnancies. Ectopic not tubal pregnancies, not, yeah. not not tubal ligations. Um, ectopic pregnancies where a, a child, an embryo, uh, implants in um, the fallopian tube. You can remove the section of fallopian tube that the child is in because you're removing that which is going to rupture. An unintended secondary effect is that child dies. You can't just go scrape out the fallopian tube, um, which would be under more of under the abortion itself, right? Right. It's the action. The actions are different. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a lot of very particular, often very like, I don't want to say niche, but very particular situations where this principle of double effect comes into play. Um, and I, I guess I'd say, if you want to learn more, go look up the principle of double effect. Go look up just war theory. Yeah, I mean, I would think um, the the what's the bioethics? It's the ncbcenter.org. Okay, so it's National Catholic Bioethics Center. They're NCBC. solid. NCBC.org. Well, it's ncbcenter.org. But oh, uh, the sorry. National Catholic Bioethics Center is what it is. And go look it up. And they got a lot of stuff on principle of double effect and applying this principle yeah. to medical situations. Um, and to just know you're not alone. You can also just go to your priest or go to someone who trusts, who's orthodox, who wants to withhold, uphold, uphold uh, the church's teaching. Um, but make sure that these distinctions are made. So yeah, thank you the, for that fantastic question. Yeah, because there, uh, there are week-long seminars about this kind of stuff. In this situation, in that situation, this is like a really, really deep topic. But those are kind of the terminology and the terms you need to, uh, to go learn more. Yeah, and you'll bring them your question, and they'll give you a pick-me-up to answer it. So it's time for our pick-me-up. Well, hang on. Can such things be forgiven? Absolutely. <laughs> I, I was jumping the gun. I was jumping the gun. Yeah, okay, yeah. this is a second question. Thank you. Um, so, you know, the people bring up the unforgivable sin. You know, it's in scripture. Jesus talks mm-hmm. about there. There's an unforgivable sin, and there's a lot of questions. And people are like, "Wait a second, doesn't God forgive? Can He forgive anything?" And absolutely, yes. The unforgivable sin scholars have uh, surmised is unrepentance. So, so like right. He's He God keeps our free will. He under He respects our free will. Otherwise, otherwise we cannot love. And so, me choosing to not repent. Is the only thing that can't be forgiven, right? Because, because mercy has to meet repentance. It's you, you can't mm-hmm. you can't force yeah. mercy upon someone. That's not mercy. Exactly. So, uh, yes, if someone's truly sorry for their sins. Prodigal son, prodigal father, waiting. You're not just going to be the slave that comes back and mm-hmm. serves. He's yep. got sandals for you. He's got a ring. He's going to put on your finger. He's got a new robe for you. He's slaughtering in the fattened calf. Welcome back, son and daughter of the father. Amen. That was a pick me up. It was. <laughs> Bean of the week. We Let's all go. need a little pick me up. Here's ours. All right. Peter. I'll go real quick. I want to give a shout out to a a free product, I guess. A free newsletter from Catholic Company called Get Fed, mm-hmm. where we send you a an email every day. It's great. And it's like Catholic trivia. It's Catholic living. It's stories from the saints. It's prayers and devotions. It's absolutely awesome. It's really fun to read. You learn a lot and it's really quick and it's totally free. So uh, just check it out. It's called Get Fed, getfed.com or catholiccompany.com slash get fed. We'll, I'll put a link somewhere. Um, and yeah, it's just really awesome. So check it out. Sweet. My bean is a juxtaposition, if you will, uh, between two things that I recently encountered uh, one was a commercial that just blew me away at how aggressively secular it was. You know, like sometimes, <laughs> sometimes people try to hide. Like culture is like, oh, uh-huh. we're gonna be sneaky about it. It's like, no. Yeah. Now this crazy idea that like you are set free by un- unshackling yourself from family, like children will destroy you and make you less happy. Um, that is the lie that is trying to be peddled by the secular world. And it, and it reared its ugly head in a visible wireless commercial. Have you seen this visible wireless commercial? Oh, I think so. This was a Super Bowl ad, wasn't it? I, it might have been on the Super Bowl because it was, uh, but I just saw it like on a YouTube stream or whatever. Uh-huh. But but it was like this 
this couple and they have like kids around them. And she's like, yeah, we live together. So we figured we'd get married to, you know, get the family discount on our on wireless, wireless bill. bill. And I'm like, okay, strike number Ooh. one. Like people <laughs> choosing to get married only for the family discount. I mean, and I then think it happens. Like, Maybe not for cell phones, but just for money. Just, oh, well, it makes sense. We'll get a mortgage together. Well, that's a good point. It and then And then it widens the pan widens and they have more kids and they're like and then we started having more kids to get discounts on our wireless and and then she was like but then my sister called me and told me at visible wireless there's no family needed and so it's the sister sitting there with like a cup of coffee on a couch like just chilling there's no kids screaming around them there's no you, like you mean so it, you mean she's completely alone <laughs> yeah yeah well I, I was thinking if they wanted to be honest they should fast forward like to 15 years where she's like kind of sad and but anyway uh it, but it was this very brass like aggressive kids will steal your joy and guess yeah. what to get the family plan you don't need to have a family anymore you could have everything that'll make you happy by not mm -hmm. giving yourself away in a final uh like by by retaining all license and right. liberty in your life, which we truly know that man only finds himself in a sincere gift of himself. Right. Right. That's the paradox of the gospel that, that Jesus shows us on the cross. Like when we give ourselves and sacrifice ourselves, love, no greater love has, has, do we know than a, a man who lays down his life for his friend? And so that's ultimately done in, in, in our, our vocations, right? Mm -hmm. A priest laying down his life, like hitting nose, hitting the marble and saying like, I, I forgo this family so that I can address the wider family of the church or a husband and wife standing before the altar, a religious sister or brother making a vow, giving themselves away in obedience to other people will actually set us free. That's the paradox. And there's a new album out by Ben Rector uh, called Sound of Joy, The Sound of Joy. I think it's the sound of joy. No, the joy of music. The joy <laughs> of music is the album, okay? And there's a song called Living My Best Life, which this is a direct addressing of this idea of like, oh, I'm living my best life. So like, I'm going to party. I'm going right, to have I'm freedom. Do whatever I'm gonna, I want. I'll do yeah. whatever I want. I'm not uh, tying myself down. And here's the lyrics. He says, this house is now a litany. Which I'm like, oh my goodness, mm. like right off the bat, yeah. he's got this religious, yep. uh, you know, symbolism. This house is now a litany. Things I thought I'd never be. A man who has options or ha has opinions on an ottoman, on, among other things. <laughs> so he's like talking about, <laughs> how he's like, now he has opinions on ottomans. Like that's where he is right now. Yep. I used to think I'd miss the road, the crushing fame and sold out shows. Now I just sing head, shoulders, knees, and toes like I've forgotten them. Boom, baby. Yeah. Uh, but I, and then it says, but I'm alive and baby, I'm thriving. I'm living my best life. I wake up with the sunrise. It does not look a thing like I thought it would. I've been getting my steps in and I sleep with my best friend. It's the best that it's been in a long time. I'm living my best life. And I'm just going to keep reading. I know you got to struggle with no, it. No, this is great. Uh, I'm loving this. Sometimes this sucks to tell the truth. And I took it hard like people do. I'm learning how to eat the fruit that is in season. Never thought I'd be a grown ass man. You might have to bleep that out. But you know <laughs> what they say of best laid plans. Now I'm holding on to my daughter's hand and I've got a reason to be alive. I was listening to the song. I was weeping. In my office, because I don't weep at sad things, Peter. I weep at truth. Yeah. The beauty of truth. Yeah. And, and the lies of the world are not beautiful at all. But that is beautiful. Thank you, Ben Rector, for diagnosing the woes of the world and then joyfully expressing the truth. Yeah. I need another pick-me-up now. <laughs> that it's just look just go listen to the to the album and to that song and i'll stop crying and i need to go party at mardi gras <laughs> all right you've all been right. listening to 
Catholic Coffee Talk with me, Father Brad, and our resident good Catholic, Peter Gohn. Coffee Talk is brought to you by the Catholic Company as part of the Good Catholic Podcast Cooperative. If this episode has blessed you, you can find more content at goodcatholic.com. As always, we ask you to leave a review, a rating, share the pod with a friend, or simply pray for us and our mission. If you have a question of your own that has been percolating, shoot us an email at askapriest at goodcatholic.com, or, we can, or you can leave a voice message at speakpipe dot com slash catholic coffee talk we might feature your message on a future episode and we'll answer all your questions to the best of our ability to quote the psalmist taste and see that the lord is good continue to drink deeply from our great faith we'll talk next week peace <laughs>